Halloween is almost upon us, and we're talking about the Salem Witch Trials today, Deathlings. And I'm actually reporting live from Salem. No stock photo witches for you. Oh no, we are on location. I'm in some very spooky woods. For over 300 years, an unassuming rocky ledge sat largely unnoticed near Seven Pope Street in Salem, Massachusetts. Streets were paved, houses sprung up, a Walgreens drugstore was erected. Though Salem has always known that they share a past with one of the darkest parts of American history, nobody realized that just beyond the glow of Walgreens neon lights was the exact spot where Salem's history turned deadly. While it was long believed that the condemned were hanged at the top of Gallows Hill, the aptly named Gallows Hill Project recently proved that it was in fact near the base of the hill where the victims were hanged. It is that rocky ledge by the Walgreens called Proctor's Ledge where the victims of the witch trials met their death in the summer of 1692. It's very unclear where the ledge actually is, and I'm kind of just in people's backyards. I think I'm trespassing. Whoops. We found it. We have the ledge. We have the ledge. If you're not familiar with the Salem Witch Trials, here are the basics. In January of 1692, 11-year-old Abigail Williams, 11-year-old Anne Putnam, and 9-year-old Elizabeth Paris started behaving strangely. They screamed, contorted their bodies, and made unnatural sounds. When a doctor diagnosed the girl's affliction as supernatural, magistrates pressured them into accusing Sarah Osborne, a sick, elderly widow, Tichaba, a slave from the Caribbean, and Sarah Good, a pregnant, mentally ill beggar woman of witchcraft. The immigrant, the elderly, and the infirm. And they were all women. <laughs> That's like American scapegoat bingo. Osborne, Tichaba, and Good, all known as community outcasts, were brought to trial for afflicting the girls. Osborne and Good maintained their innocence, while Tichaba admitted to being in league with the devil, though most likely she was being coerced, aka beaten by her master, the influential Reverend Paris, father of Elizabeth Paris. All three women were jailed. Sarah Osborne died in prison before she could be executed, and Tichaba, because she confessed, was held for 13 months before being sold and released. Sarah Good gave birth in jail and was executed on July 19, 1692. But the fate of these three women, and others like them, did not extinguish the community's fear of witches in their midst. It only stoked the flames of hysteria and paranoia. It also didn't help that it was a commonly held Puritan belief that any conflict was the devil's doing, thus allowing the most powerful members of the community to conveniently accuse anyone they were feuding with of witchcraft. And FYI, no witches were burnt at the stake in Salem. That's totally a European thing. In America, we hang our witches, thank you very much. It's the American way. From 1692 to 1693, over 200 women and men were accused of being witches. About 150 were arrested and 20 were executed. 19 of those executed were hanged at Proctor's Ledge. Giles Corey, the one man who was not hanged, was pressed to death in an attempt to torture him into pleading guilty or not guilty because a person who did not enter a plea could not be tried. Pressing involves putting a board on one's chest, then progressively putting more weight on the board until the person is crushed. In his final hours, the sheriff had to force Corey's bulging tongue back into his mouth with his cane. Throughout his pressing, which lasted over two days, the only words Corey said were, more weight. So more weight was added until he was killed. All of the other convicted witches were hanged between early June and late September of 1692. On the day of an execution, the condemned would be carted to what was called Gallows Hill, but not to the top as was previously thought. Why is that? 
First of all, it would be extremely difficult to get a cart full of people to the top of a hill. Second, a hanging had to be highly visible, something the summit of Gallows Hill was not. It was the 17th century, after all, and hangings were the social event. After scouring eyewitness testimony, comparing old and new maps, and even using satellite imagery, the Gallows Hill Project concluded that the site of the hangings had to be Proctor's Ledge. It was public land at the time, available to the community to let their sheep graze, it provided a good vantage point from the street below, and it was close to the center of town, but not too close. The name Gallows Hill is also a misnomer. No gallows were used in the hanging of the victims. Instead, they were hanged from the numerous oak trees at the ledge. Once the victims were dead, their bodies hanging from the trees, they were cut down and dropped into a crevice below Proctor's ledge. That being said, there's no evidence that the crevice was ever used as a mass grave. The ground is too rocky and the soil too thin to make the deep pit required for burying multiple bodies. Furthermore, no evidence of skeletonized human remains have ever been found in the area in and around the crevice. Though nobody is sure exactly what became of the bodies, historians agree that the families of the witch trial victims most likely stole the bodies away and secretly buried them. One such body was that of George Jacobs Sr., hanged on August 19, 1692. My birthday! Fun. It's believed that the Jacobs family stole his body back and buried it on their property. The remains thought to be his were rediscovered in 1864, reburied, then uncovered again in the 1950s. Jacobs' bones were kept by the city of Danvers until 1992, when they were finally laid to rest at the home of Rebecca Nurse, another executed victim. Rebecca Nurse and George Jacobs Sr. are the only two witch trial victims to have known grave sites. All others were smuggled away to unmarked graves that have since been lost to time. By January of 1693, the trials had concluded and the remaining accused were pardoned by May of the same year. Unfortunately, the damage had already been done and the town of Salem had to begin the long, painful process of healing from the sins of their past. Many involved in the trials, from jurors to judges, publicly apologized, and in 1711, the Massachusetts legislature restored the rights and good names of the accused. Before she died, even Anne Putnam, one of the original accusers, apologized for her actions, claiming she had been deluded by Satan. If you ever make it out to Salem, Deathlings, by all means, enjoy the town. I often talk about what I call the witch to kitsch factor, where killings, atrocities, and disasters turn into kitschy fun if enough time has passed. That's certainly what's happened in Salem. It's part of their identity. Enjoy the kitsch, but if possible, take a quiet moment to remember that Salem is a town that has been shaped by death. Well, that's kind of a somber ending. Everyone leaves in a thoughtful mood. Hey, wh what are you guys gonna be for Halloween, huh? Tell, tell me in the comments. It's a fun channel, right? This video was made with generous donations from death enthusiasts just like you. It's a Walgreens.